Michelle, you had mentioned that uh, your own experience with miking um, a saxophone, and I think that I think you were the the, the performer, right? Yeah. You're yeah. So sax. I met. And, my, and, yes. I met my husband playing in a jazz big band, and uh, I started playing the saxophone when I was twelve years old. And I practiced a lot. I spent a lot of hours uh, working on my tone and, you know, sort of perfecting my sound. And then I would get on stage to do a solo and I would get a SM57 jammed down the bell of my saxophone. And I didn't know what that was at the time. I just knew, you know, based on what it looked like. And I hated it because it gave it a very sort of honky, nasally sound um, it's sort of where that frequency response is peaked and mm-hmm. it's not quite meshed up with where the frequency response would peak in a, on a tenor saxophone. And so, you know, all that time spent practicing would feel like it was wasted <laughs> when I'd be standing <laughs> on the stage, like hearing that sound and going, Oh, this is terrible. And our director would constantly shove the microphone down the bell of my saxophone and I would try to flee the microphone. Oh. So what what mic did you find? I guess you've got one that says Heil on it. What mic sounds good on a tenor saxophone to you? This one's my favorite. The one I'm actually using for my voice, too. Uh, ah, the PR35. Kind of ironic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Now, earlier you showed us those two mics and the, that little mini one. What was that called again? Yeah, that's a Handy Mic Pro Plus. Oh, teeny, handy, tiny little handy guy. Mic. Handy mic. Yeah. And so what are, what are some typical uses for that little guy? Uh, drums and a lot of people will mount these actually like permanently mount them inside a Leslie speaker. Oh, so, yeah. So, and it'll okay. pick up that. So in case the listeners don't know what a Leslie speaker is, it's, uh, they used to be used for like theater organs yeah. and, um, they have an oscillating speaker horns inside them and it gives it almost like a vibrato sound. So it kind of has this, this wavy sound as it comes out and they're notoriously hard to mic because where do you put the microphone and how do you angle it? And I recently uh, was at a venue here where they were trying to get the microphone in just the right place. And it was a rock band that was using it and they were using it very loudly. (laughs) So it was almost like, you know, trying to mic something that was just blowing air straight into the microphone. So it's like putting a windscreen on it. Like it was somebody talking into it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Wow. Uh, I'm sorry, Chris, did did you have a comment? Oh, no, I totally agree because we have a Hammond C3 organ with a Leslie and uh, whenever we use it, miking it has always been a challenge. Uh, So yeah, I can appreciate exactly what you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah, double windscreen was the solution. Yeah, yeah. Michelle, Michelle, um, you know, in in Heil sound, I guess Bob Heil got started with live concert sound. I think he was called in to fix some problems and make a concert actually work, and things just, yeah. uh, grew, grew from there. So, uh, talk to me about what are uh, what are some differences between miking live sound and miking things like in a radio station, like a lot of our listeners and viewers are going to be engineers and performers and, and such and, and operators at, at radio stations. I guess the big difference is in live sound, you're combating feedback. So you've got to have some good directionality and, and, and you want to, you know, not have things moving around a lot in terms of what's going to feed back. Uh, or maybe there are other more important factors. So what are, to you are some big differences between miking live sound and miking studio mics or outdoors like Chris is doing? 